Hello guys and welcome back to the Motor Recon Podcast. I'm your host Adam. I'm joined again today by Rob. Um, what we're going to look at today is because something we were discussing off mic is convertibles versus coupes or cars brought out as coupes that they then did convertibles of um, that we wish they didn't or vice versa. Uh, and also to talk about some of the controversial ones that we might actually prefer the convertible uh, in some ways. Yeah. So, first on the list, probably my favourite car in this list just for because of what it is. Yeah, yeah. But the Aston Martin DBS. This is the original one, not the... Well, not the original, but the one from James Bond. Yeah, um, so, so like... 2008 yeah. and nine sort of time. Now, for me, one of the best-looking cars ever made. Agreed. Personally yeah. think that's the case. We have got one in Bond spec up here, which is as it should be, mm -hmm. with a manual gearbox. Yeah, as we both agree it should be. Absolutely as it should be. Uh, and also we've didn't, we've noticed as well just on these ones that the manual variant has held its value significantly better than the automatic versions. There's an awful lot less of them as well, which surprises me, particularly with this one, because obviously, let's be honest, a lot of the people who are buying this DBS is because they saw it in James Bond. Yeah. And in that movie, he obviously has the manuals. It surprises me they didn't sell that many manuals of this one. Yeah, I think people just are a bit daft, because... I suppose in some ways it's good for the people that did buy manuals because their values have held significantly higher. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're not even that far off what they were list in some cases, but yeah. the automatics you can get for less than 70 grand. But like I say, one of the topics that we're definitely going to have to discuss on a future podcast is for the original Vanquish, Aston Martin are now offering you the opportunity to send it back to them and they'll fit it with a manual. Oh, that's So it comes out of the cup holder. Where the cup holder used to be, the manual that, gear lever okay, comes that, out. That is so we cool. will discuss that on yeah, a future in, a, in another one. Yeah. But for now, this one, I mean, a little bit about the car. Obviously, it, you probably all do know it from the James Bond film, and you're probably all well aware of what it was, but it's a big V12 engine. Um, it's a naturally so aspirated. 6-litre six, six, uh, yeah. six V12, which is what you want, or 6.2. Um, 191 miles an hour. Uh, 510 brake horsepower, not 16, 4.3 seconds. Yeah, it's like, a, as you say, it's just a lot sharper version of the DB9. Yeah. And one of the rare occasions where I actually prefer the sportier variant to the standard one, whereas I'm more of your standard Carrera 911 spec kind of guy, and I don't like the super exotic specs of a lot of the supercars, I do prefer the DBS yeah. to the DB9. Well, I think what Aston Martin did with this one is they did it properly. So they've made it more aggressive. You can't. No one can deny it looks more aggressive than a standard DB9. However, they've got just tiny little, just little louvers in the bonnet. Very subtle. They've not put a big wing on it. Yeah, you're right. They've just yeah. put like a tiny lip spoiler. They've got nice, just slightly flared wheel arches and a few little grills here and there. Just very subtle. Yeah, I agree. As in, I think it's enough to make it stand out a little bit more compared to the DB9, but not so much that you ruin the. I mean, the whole point of that made the DB9 so nice was that sort of classic shape that underpinned yeah, it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think they did a fantastic job, and hands down, if you are in the market to buy a DBS, get it in a manual, because these old automatic gearboxes were horrific anyway. Yeah. They were always clunky and really slow. You have to service them a lot more. They're nowhere near as reliable, and they don't hold the value clearly anywhere near as much, given they are half the price. Yeah, I might add, so obviously we went for the full bond spec one, and it clearly shows, because obviously this is a very low mileage example of only 8,600, but it's going to set you back 125 £5,000. Yeah, which, and I know for a fact there'll be no wiggle room in that price. That Absolutely. Is the price. Yeah, that will be the price. Judging of what other ones are selling for online and things like that, that's the price you're paying. And, and no doubt it will sell. Oh, yeah, absolutely. At that price. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I don't really want to move on from this, but we shall. Mm -hmm. This, though, another Aston Martin. Uh, probably if I was, if it was my own money, one I would have bought new. Yeah. But this is essentially new, this particular example. So it's the V12 Vantage S of the yeah. old Vantage shape. Not the new one, mm. the old Vantage. But as you said, we haven't actually got a V12 Vantage yet. So we haven't, but it's definitely coming. It's coming, a, it's coming it down the line. Yeah, but obviously. Well, that, that new, um, the new roads to thing, the version with no roof or windows or anything, that's having a V12. Okay. So it is coming. Yep. Um, looking at this one, though, again, we also felt, as far as the Vantage was concerned, for the spec that we wanted, you can only have... well. Obviously, the V8 Vantage is nice, but if you were to have a choice, I would always choose the V12 variant of an Aston. Yeah, now this one, again, we didn't really discuss it much in the last one, but the DBS, obviously, they did do a convertible version of it as well. Again, ruined the car, I feel, personally. Yeah, and also as well for me, um, it was well regarded as... The whole point of the DBS was that it was a more taut and 
better handling version of the DB9, lopping the roof off it and making it less rigid and wallowing. And wallowing and stuff, yeah. doesn't really match with that sort of mission statement. No, and I think it is the same with this one because the point of the Vantage was it was a very small packaged car, great for sort of just chucking around the country road. While it was big and lumpent and heavy, but you could also this was the tiny little package you'd get for big edge and dinky yeah. car. Yeah, for that's a bit essentially of fun. where they've yeah. gone with that. Now, again, I'm the same as you. I love the V8. That obviously looked pretty much the same apart from the yeah, hood vents, yeah. but I love the looks of the V8, and they did do the great manual in it. Um, but the V12, I think, you just, if you get an Aston Martin, I sometimes think it should have a V12. It's one, of, and I think it comes down to holding value as well. Um, we yeah. obviously we've discussed on the podcast before how cheap you can pick up the V8 Vantage of this oh, it's era. Ridiculous. For. You're talking twenty odd thirty k for. Whereas some of these V12 Vantages have held the value significantly better. Well, there's one that so again. This is just our personal thing. We know other people are different, but we do prefer the manual options of this. So for the manual V12s compared to the automatic V12s, again, the value has been held significantly better. Mm. Significantly better. So the example we've got here is actually for sale very near to us, uh, just in Wilmslow, south of Manchester. Uh, it's for £139,990, and it's done 154 miles. It's essentially new. Yep. Um, as you say, it's a brand new car. and It's in Miami blue as well. Yeah, pretty which cool. Which is absolutely stunning colour. I think, for me, um, it's interesting because this is, price-wise, not a million miles away from the DBS we just looked at. Yeah. And I would go for the DBS. Yeah, I think, personally, looks-wise, again, 100% agree with you. I'd absolutely have the DBS. While this one you'd get, I think it's even still in manufacturer's warranty. It is actually still in manufacturer's warranty, this one, so you get a few little things with it. But if you're looking for an investment piece, exactly, that's and what something I'm you might want to drive, I'd go for the DBS. It will, longer term, I suspect, be a better investment. I also think is the cool factor as well, because let's be honest, as nice as the you know V12 Vantage is, it has never been in something famous. No, not really. Whereas, obviously, yeah, you, you, has you, actually done something. If you have famous. it in a bomb spec, I think that's where that, you could, yeah, that's, that's where you're going to make your money come back. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this particular one, obviously, is absolutely stunning in saying the Miami blue. But a little bit about the car. So, not to sixty three point eight seconds, so it is quicker. But it you'd is. expect that bigger engine, same size engine, and nearly a more decade power. newer. Yeah, decade newer. It's actually got more power. It's five hundred and sixty five. Yeah. It's a smaller car as well. Uh, but not 63.7 seconds, top speed of 205 miles an hour. Oh, so significantly faster. Yeah, significantly faster. But again, out of the options, I get, I'll probably go for the DBS. And I also think the DBS is fast enough by anybody's imagination, but I think it'll be a hell of a lot better as a GT. Yeah, it's more made for it, isn't it? Does it? Think, I think, obviously, the Vantage was never based on such a GT sort no. of platform the, like the DB9 was. But again, this one, they, they did do the obviously convertible manual version of the V12 Vantage. Looks-wise, yeah. I don't think it looks as good as... No, neither do I. Don't. No. Uh, it doesn't drive anywhere near as well, according to when I reviewed it, because it is a lot more wallowy, because yeah. they don't have the carbon tubs of the newer cars. And yeah, that's um, probably something that, obviously, we haven't actually included anything like the brand new McLarens or the brand new Ferraris. Yeah, they're, they're no which, different, because the carbon tub is where the strength is, and that's all below. Technology but, has now moved on enough that it's actually mm, closed the gap between and, and the their, two. And their convertibles are always hard top, usually, so you when it's up it kind of is the coupe yeah and I think technology's moved on enough for the brand new cars with the carbon tops and things it doesn't actually make that much of a difference anymore no but, but the, the, back in these back, yeah, back in those in these days, days yeah. this is what you wanted so, exactly so I'd have that but again the, we looked at some there was particularly a Red Bull edition of this one it's going for 250-ish thousand pounds yeah which is a quarter of a million for a, a, V8 van, a V12 Vantage sorry it's, it's a lot of money but you need to be considering is but that is a, the right is, move for you it's a manual one though yeah. and I, I really don't know how many they made but I'm pretty sure it wasn't many extremely limited we yeah. expect so yeah. that's probably why it's why it's held its value so another this is a bit of a con- controversial one to uh, yeah it is I know it is yeah now so this is the Audi R8 probably a lot of people out there are fans of the Audi R8 and I myself am a fan yeah. of the R8 this particular one is the Gen 1 so the V8 but again with the gated manual now this is the only car in this list I can say I've actually driven yeah and it was it was lovely with the gator manual. It wasn't very fast. Doesn't matter. But, that's but, yeah, that, but that, I think, as you say, and obviously the internet may slay me for this one, but this is my preferred R8 out of the entire lineup. Yeah, actually, it's not the only current list I've driven, but we'll go on to the one later. Yep. But yeah, so, um, yeah, I would, again, have the manual of the R8. 
and again, these old automatics in this generation were known for being pretty poor. Mm. So again, it's it's the it's the catch twenty two. Do you want that clunky automatic and a very poor driving experience, or do you want to be involved for fairly similar price? If I'm honest, they're both around the thirty between and yeah, thirty and forty thousand pounds. And that's interesting um, because when we were obviously we were able to break down the uh, sort of search results between manuals and automatics of the exact car that we wanted. It was nearly a 50-50 split, give or take. In the, the RA, RA, yeah. So Whereas for the Aston DBS, there was hardly any there was seven, manuals. I yeah, it was seven the, in the UK. The divide seven. between the two was massive compared to the RA. So clearly more people wanted the manual variant of the RA. Yeah, and I'm not sure why. that. It, maybe it is because just because the automatic in them was pretty poor at the time, I'm not too sure. But this particular one is a 2007 car, so it is old. Yeah. Uh, it does show on the interior, it is obviously quite aged, but we did mention it off mic that you could, because the screen looks like it would just slide out and you could put a new one in with CarPlay and things like that. If you just wanted that little refresh. I don't think it's terribly aged, though. No, no, the seats no. and things in the normal bit is the same, pretty much the same as the new one. But I could just, certainly, I could live with it. I could. I could live I could. with that, yeah. So it actually is, it's on 52,000 miles, this, which in... In since 2007, it's it's not that bad, is it? 13 years, 50 no. thousand miles. It's nothing. We're at that mileage now, and we're in much newer cars. Uh, and it's a lovely grey spec. It actually has the V10 wheels. They only brought these wheels out when the V10 came out. Um, could you get the V10 with the manual? You could, and they are very expensive. Uh, said Delaney, a lot of you will probably know him from YouTube. He's uh, just bought a V10 manual, mm. um, and they were about double the price of the V8 with the manual. Right. They, also, okay. they are also about double the price of a V10 with an uh, automatic. Yeah, well, um, but again, there was not many for sale in the UK at all. Uh, so I think it would be tough between for me between choosing the V10 manual and the V8 manual because that V10 sounds incredible. It does. It's the same one that's in. The, it wasn't the same one that's in the uh, Gallardo. Yeah, uh, it did sound good. Uh, and I have driven a Gallardo, and it did scream pretty well. But for the price difference, if they are a lot more expensive than the V8 manual for me, I would save my money. Yeah, and go for the V8 manual. The, the one thing you will get back with the V10 one is it'll probably will hold its value oh sure more. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, because like I said they are still they are still holding the value quite well because they're a lot rarer I think it's a question of whether how much money you're spending on these actually yeah. matters well th this particular R8 right, we're looking at is 33 grand yeah exactly so yeah, for thirty-three grand, you're not going normal. To... People can actually afford to buy that. Yeah, so which I don't think is too bad. So it's, it's four point six seconds to sixty, which again, it's not bad, but it, it didn't feel fast when you were in it. Mm. But that's because I just come out of a Lambo, right? Um, and the four hundred and fifteen brake horsepower and one hundred eighty-seven mile per hour top speed. So it's it, it, by no means a slow car. No, <laughs> not at all. But again, the convertible version of the R8 in this particular generation, they've improved it on the new one, I'll give them that. Agreed. But Agreed. in this particular generation, did not work as a convertible in my eyes at all. It just did not look right proportion-wise. Interestingly, with the new R8, I think it's the coupe version of the new R8. I don't, you don't, I you don't genuinely actually fit, no. do I? No, yeah, it's we, quite... <laughs> yeah, we were, we were messing around with an R8 uh, not that long ago, and... Uh, yeah, it was the coupe one, and the seat as far back as it physically goes. I, I the can't seat actually get my knees in. Yeah, Rob doesn't fit, which is a bit of a downside if you were going to buy one, because you would have literally no choice but to buy the uh, But also, the, convertible. the question is that I'm not a particularly tall guy. Sure, I have no. long legs. Well, you're six foot, aren't you? Yeah, but, so... I've, but I mean, I've got disproportionately long legs like a frog. <laughs> yes, you have, to be fair. I'm always, whenever we go and look at cars, whether we're at sort of Geneva or Goodwood and we find something that we've never seen before, and say it's like a family saloon, we usually use as the yardstick of shoving me in the back. Yeah, does Rob fit in the back? Because of the if car? I can get my legs my knee, with knee room in the back, it's done quite well. Yeah. I would say. Which? Because like the X6 couldn't fit in that. No, which is supposed to be a big car. Couldn't fit in the X5 either. No, which is it's embarrassing for a car that well, size. Well, I might add, I couldn't fit behind someone who had a relatively tall driving position. Well, it, to wasn't be fair, it? the yeah. one where we first tried it, it was in my driving position. Yeah, exactly. And, you did, and I'm I'm only an inch or two smaller than you, and I, and you didn't fit behind me. And you're an average size bloke, so it's yeah. a good comparison. Yeah, and you didn't fit behind me, which is embarrassing on a big four before. Yeah, but. You actually don't fit in an R8 coupe in the new version. You will definitely fit in the old one. I can tell you that now. Yeah, they, have, they did seem a lot more spacious, to be fair. But a great car for thirty odd grand. I don't think you can go wrong. Yeah, a bit of a bargain, really. Yeah, and they, and they were reliable. So, again, we have spoken about this before, but it's the perfect example because this one, opposite, mm. designed as a convertible. Yep. 
Then they brought out the coupe, and we both prefer the coupe. Um, mainly because the coupe um, has a brand new, as you said, Top Gear did a brilliant piece on this back in the day, because obviously they explained that the coupe has an entire new side body panel, which makes it a lot lighter. Yeah. Uh, more rigid as well in the corners. Not to mention, obviously, it provides a lot more space in the boot. The One of the big Achilles heels of the convertible F-Type is it it's got a really, really got small one. boot yeah. with none of that convertible kit that it needs to lug around. Yeah, the boot's actually the boot's, not that bad. You yeah. can fit golf clubs in it, which is not for us, but you, you can fit them a in. A lot of people who buy these would probably want to put golf well, they, clubs in. They are in, known yeah. as golfists' cars, aren't exactly, they? Exactly, so. yeah. That's the stereotype. So the particular one, uh, again, we both prefer the coupe, but the particular one we had is uh, just a V6 uh, manual, yep. which I think is the car of choice in the f type range. I mean, I'd love the sound of the V8. Oh, no, but, but, and this but, is probably a controversial thing, but for me, it's a question of... Jags should I, have a V6. Yeah, for me, I like Jags with six pots from the days of the E-Type. Yeah. Sort of, I don't know. I think it harkens back to a bit of history with well, Jack. Well, in theory, this is sort of a predecessor to the E type, being mm. obviously the F type, and it is a similar sort of principle. Yeah. Where it's a convertible. And they did do an E type coupe as well. Yeah, but it uh, started its life, started out. life out as a yeah. convertible. Yeah. Like this did. And that started out with a V6, and then eventually did get a V12. Yeah. But this has obviously done V6 and V8. And also, you can't even get a V6 in new facelifted F-types anymore, which I think is a real shame. And also, another thing that I think they've chucked from the range is the manual, which is the one we're looking at today. Yeah, which is stupid. Is a car like this, a little sports car, needs a manual. Well, I think you should at least offer the option. Yeah. You know. So, um, this one is £37,000. It's a 68 reg. Um, yeah, so yeah, you still have your full manufacturer warranty and everything. It's on 1,300 miles. Exactly. It's nearly yeah. new. It's relatively new, um, as you say. It's about that's about six thousand miles below average. Um, it has gorgeous white leather seats as well. Yeah, it's a white coupe as well. <laughs> what's the specs on it then? What sort of power? So are they this one, out? obviously, get, being the basic V six. So this one is three hundred and thirty five brake horsepower. Again, not bad. Yeah, you don't need any more than that. Five and a half seconds to sixty. Mm. Again, not bad. Uh, and a top speed of one hundred and sixty one, which is way more than you can do on any road. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah, I think as far as top speeds are concerned, it doesn't really matter, no. does it? And these things drift like they're on <laughs> slicks on a wet day. So, to be fair, I don't think this one has a limited slip diff, though. I don't think the standard V six gets that out of the box. No, so. but it's they are still quality for drifting. No, I mean, yeah, it'll these. still be a good laugh, exactly. And also, it comes down to the question of, all right, so how much drifting do you do on the real world? <laughs> In I, the I, real mean, world. I mean, it's one of those, isn't but it? We've all been down to an empty car park at, at night and had a bit of a handbrake turn session, but actually, I was always on the snow day from college, but we won't discuss that on here. I'll incriminate myself. Um, next one is a car that we both decidedly agree that needs a manual and it needs a hard roof. 100%. It's the point of the car. Yeah, exactly. It is, it is it the, is the, the purpose of its existence. This is... yeah. See, it's a Porsche 911. Mm -hmm. Where Again, you prefer the clean design, simple looking 911s yeah. over the... I mean, me personally, I do like the GT products, but I but wish... we both agree... GT3 Touring. Yeah, but we both agree on they need whatever if you prefer the obviously the more extreme version i prefer the cleaner versions i guarantee we both meet in the middle on regardless of that it should have a manual yeah and it needs to be a tin top. well that's why when they did the 911r which obviously it was basically a gt3 without the wing without anything on it and it had a manual gearbox yeah the prices then they went up to silly money i saw one for sale for nearly seven hundred thousand pound but then or shot all their owners in the foot and brought out a manual GT3. 911R is arguably my favourite 911 See, ever. I, I, if it were going down that sort of road, because they brought out the GT3 Touring. Yeah, and I, that, which, that is Which it is a 911R, it? It essentially, is, it? yeah. but it's, the, it's full GT. I think that was a GT3 RS. I could be wrong, don't quote me on that. I think it was the RS rather than just the GT3, but with a manual and the no, no wings and nothing. Well, so as I said, but the 911R actually has that little bit of heart back to history. Like, it has a nice duck bill spoiler on there. No, no, it's clean. The R, oh, is, is the it R clean? The, it was the Sport Classic that had the duck bill. I like the Sport Classic then as yeah, well. Yeah, and it had the yeah. old wheels. Because it had the old wheels. Yeah, it had the old wheels. But the point is, we both agree. And also, Porsche do some of the best manuals in the business. 100%. Seven speeds sometimes. Exactly. Well, seven it, speeds now. They, honestly, they do. So, I re fully recommend that you go on to Carfection on YouTube. And Henry Catchpole does a brilliant Carfection episode with a manual 911 explaining why there's still a reason that manuals should exist. Oh, yeah. And it really genuinely sums up, I think, both of our feelings on the purpose of a manual gearbox. Yeah. Which is for a, where for a car like a 911, you're meant to be involved. Yeah. And it's just like car people, car fans, generally most of the general public don't really care. 
but car fans do prefer manuals generally. Yeah, because yeah, you are more involved. Rule, yeah. If you enjoy driving and you enjoy being involved in driving, you need a manual because the automatics just have nothing. They're fairly dull, even if it's a good one. But this particular one, it's a Carrera T, mm. so it is the turbo engine. Um, but that being said, all new Porsche 911s have a turbo in it. They do, but this is the Gen Before, isn't it? Yeah. So this, is, this is the 991 Carrera T, uh, the one TGE had um, mm. in yellow. Uh, this one is red. It's again proper seven speed manual gearbox. It's got the nice interior. Uh, it's, I think it actually is better than the new interiors on the 911. And controversial, I think it looks better. I think it looks a little the better. The yeah. new one, I don't know if you've seen any of the renderings of the new. Well, Porsche have just released a sports package for the new 992. Yeah. And basically, it is a GT3, but not being a GT3. Yeah. So, why would anybody who has an ounce of common sense buy a normal 911? Basically, put GT3 parts on it, but not have a GT3. Yeah, you just have a GT3. Yeah, it, it's it is a bit silly, but anyway, these were renowned for being quite nice to drive. They always usually are. Yeah, being quite nice to drive. Well, that's what happens when you perfect a car for fifty years. Yeah, I mean, you know my views on Porsche. I'm not a massive Porsche fan. If I was going to get a Porsche, it'd be a Cayman. Oh yeah, I I really like the 911 because fundamentally the engine shouldn't sit out the back. Yeah. Yet they've stuck with it for fifty years, and it actually, and because of that sort of yeah. bloody mindedness, I respect them for that. Yeah, and because of that bloody mindedness, though, they've come out with a car that genuinely is world class, despite yeah. that fact. It's what it gets compared to. Yeah. Isn't it? Everything everyone compares cars. Like, it's the yardstick. It's the yardstick of sports cars. Yeah, and usually like the GT3 RS and stuff like that for a road car, you're not going to get much better than that on track, unless you're yeah. talking you're going to like six seven five. McLaren's You're talking or, crazy money yeah, about that. A lot point. more expensive yeah, exactly, money yeah. to get one. Okay, now, this one, one of them, well, it's not the car from my childhood as such because it was a 360 that was around when we were there. But yeah. So the Ferrari F430, now, this is one of the rare occasions where I genuinely prefer the convertible version than the coupe. Yeah. Uh, I actually do. I think it looks, it's a very. People do argue that it's not a very pretty Ferrari. I always quite like the looks of them. I think it's very plain. In it, a lot of ways. And that's is, not in some ways, a that's bad, not a bad thing. Yeah, it's no, not I, a bad thing, I agree. No. I love the rear end of the F430. I actually prefer it to the 458, which again is a very controversial thing to say, but I do prefer the twin lights over the single light. Yeah. Um, which I do prefer. This one in particular is the standard Ferrari spec, really red with cream interior. I would have had a different colour, but the lines Todd on Auto Trader said it was a manual and it wasn't when we looked at it. And again, this is another example of um, a, dis a massive sort of disproportion between those who bought autos and those that bought manuals. There weren't many manuals around. There weren't, and, in, and, and also I think it, because of that, the price of the manuals, again, is significantly more. You're talking a 40 grand premium for a manual in, in some cases. In and this I might one. add, I will say this for the record as well, this F430 has, well, I think it has the, one of the nicest looking modern manual gearboxes you will as well, you see the gear lever and the open H pattern is one of the nicest things I've ever seen it also acts back to the it's a perfect sphere on top with you with your gear numbers on it and it's a big open aluminium gated manual it looks brilliant it does and again so this is the one I have driven a uh, Ferrari um, was it, so it, wasn't, was, a it wasn't a manual no but it was okay to drive it was very poor the automatic gearbox and they get old ones generally were so I think if it was a manual I think I'd have enjoyed it a lot more yeah um, but the sound of these was always mental I think the F430 was one of the best sounding Ferraris ever made I'd agree with that uh, yeah. I prefer it personally to the V12s just a preference for me uh, especially if you get a straight pipe exhaust on them they just scream so loud but again 120 grand for a manual F430. Is it, and don't get me wrong, it looks an outstanding manual. Oh yeah, it, it looks amazing. And this particular one is a very high mileage for an F430. Yeah. Uh, it's actually on 37,000 miles, which I know that doesn't sound a lot for a car that was made in 2005, yeah. but it's 15,000 above average. Yeah, because of the manual gearbox, it's still commanding a price of 120,000 yeah. it, yeah, pounds. It's still 40 grand more than the automatics with a lot less mileage and even slightly newer. Yeah. So... No brainer. If you want, if you want to hold your value, get that. Not one. Not to mention, isn't this obviously the replacement for this? The four five eight. Did it they was. ever offer that no. with a manual? Well, then there you go. No wonder this is sort of like your last Ferrari that you can get with a proper manual box. Then. And a naturally aspirated V eight. It's the end of. Well, as you say, yeah, it's the end of an era in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, so, which yeah. is very sad. It was. Very, it is very sad because I think the four five eight now is now sort in. It has come down a little bit, but it was starting to go back up in value because when they brought out the uh, four eight eight. 
it was turbocharged and it lost a lot of the noise it lost a lot of the drama and people wanted that naturally aspirated noise yeah so it if they had have done a manual um four five eight mm. i think the premiums on them would be absolutely insane because it would be the proper last naturally aspirated manual ferrari and they do look good the four five eight i can't deny that um especially if they did it in sort of the speciality or the yeah, but they'd be they'd be a million pound car. As I say, though, I think there is room for Ferrari and McLaren to resurrect the manual gearbox in their sort of base spec cars. I'm talking yeah, about so Ferrari, so like their Ferrari entry did, level. Yeah, Ferrari did a Portofino manual. Yeah, yeah. The only problem I think with the, what they've done now is because they, in some ways, it's really bad, and we have discussed it before that they've got too much power. Well, no, that being said, that's the thing, though. I mean, as in, I'm talking about that bit sort of entry level, mid level, yeah, sort even, of mid engine stuff. 700 horsepower. Oh, yeah, but. It's, it's silly, silly power. And I think, like, a McLaren 540C, you, it was an entry level McLaren. It had 540 horsepower, which is enough. It's not obscene. It's a similar sort of thing. We've to seen advantage. numbers like this yeah. on manuals that it's are a, a tiny, lot older. Yeah, it's a tiny little package sports car, and that would that could have absolutely had a manual. Yeah. Absolutely. And that would have been a very, very, very nice car. I think there's a market for it with petrolites, which is what these cars are sort of leaning themselves to. They are, but I think with stuff like this as well, people, Ferrari particularly, because they just hung up on Formula One, that people think when they buy a Ferrari, they're buying a part of Formula One and they don't have manuals anymore. So Yeah, I guess that's they're true. Not going that way but i understand it on a track because it's not as quick yeah now don't get me wrong it'd be more fun but it's not as quick but but, but I, i'll actually throw in a honorable mention here because i'm assuming they're worth a stupid amount of money now but it's the uh, lamborghini guy i think it's the is it the balbone or the bamboo yeah they are they are quite expensive the balbone ones the rear yeah. wheel drive manual gearbox but yeah. that was because that was meant for him he said they said to him we will build you a car that you want as your parting gift and we'll make a couple of them and sell them yeah and he did straight away manual, straight away rear wheel drive, not the four wheel drive. Chuck a bit more power in it. That sounds put a brilliant. Stripe on it. Uh, honestly, and again, that was a lovely open H pattern job. Yeah, isn't they, it? they yeah. are. They are very expensive. Now, I don't know the price off the top of my head, but I was looking actually not that long ago, and they're, they've more than tripled the price of a normal. But again, car, they, they strapped a V10 onto that. Yeah. So it's. I think there's. My, I think there's room for it. Yeah, and they should maybe not now these days and age because people are just getting lazier and don't like doing manual. Plus, most of the time, people are sitting in traffic now. Yeah, and annoy as annoying as it is, most of these cars just drive around central London. Yeah, which is depressing in it's itself, stupid. isn't it? Yeah. I wouldn't even have a car if I lived there. But why on earth would you spend that much money on a supercar to drive it five miles an hour around yeah. the set? It's great for car spotting. Don't get me wrong, I love that. But why? Yeah, it's, it's, well, I suppose there is a point, isn't it? Moron would do it anyway. Getting up to near the end now. There's two cars we still want to discuss. Yeah. Now these, neither of them were offered in a manual. No, we're, we're not talking about manuals this, here. These are just the convertibles to the coupe version, but also these two are both very similar cars and they both have the same engine, things like that. So, first one, Alfa Romeo 8C. Mm. Second one, Maserati Gran, uh, Gran Turismo. Yes. Uh, and, but this is the MC Cedrale version. That's because, as you'll soon find out, the 8C is worth such an inordinate yeah. amount of money. So, they have the same engine. Yeah. I think the Maserati might even have more power. Let me just double well we can go through the performance sort of a little bit further down to be fair yeah we can do but you this is a same engine uh the mc strali one i think was even tuned slightly more but the alpha did do a convertible version mm. hands down it's nowhere near as pretty as the coupe hell no however it is still very pretty i'm not going to deny that but the coupe is the one you want in the particular i don't know what's the color called it's a, well you there. can call it alpha red can't yeah because it's essentially it what red. it is yeah, yeah. One of, genuinely for me, the best looking cars, things I've ever seen. Oh, it's a timeless design, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that will age so well. And in my personal opinion, I know you're not going to agree with this, they absolutely ruined it when they did the, um, what did you call it? Disco the, Volante. The Disco Volante based on this car. I say, hate that car. But that's the same token. And yet that's a sort of personal opinion, isn't it? It is, yeah. But I think that, obviously... I, I do like the Disco Volante, but I'm not going to say that the 8C is an ugly car and they improved it massively because yeah. it's in its own right a very pretty car yeah, it's in itself. Absolutely stunning. But again, these these have held their value amazingly. Now, it does help that seem, people bought these and never seemed to drive them. No, they, they bought... Well, they knew they were a limited run, didn't they? Yeah. So they bought them purely as an investment by the sound so of like it. We found a particularly mid-mileage one and it's got 2,200 miles on it, which... You're practically a brand new car. Yeah. 
uh, but they are commanding a price of two hundred and twenty thousand pounds. So what we thought off the back of that was obviously, do you, if you want the eight C type thrills, which is not necessarily driving pleasure. No, they were announced being pretty poor to drive. Nor even interior quality or your interior design because or build quality or build quality anything like no. This is purely for being seen in. Yeah, it's art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. art in motion. So we decided, what other Italian brand? with the same engine fills that spec which of course led us to the Maserati Gran Turismo yeah very pretty in its own right yeah I think it is a good looking car it's very big I'll give him that but it yeah. is a very pretty big car yeah um, this one has the same engine it's essentially it's slightly again it is newer the older ones had the older interior um, but this one that we found anyway was one owner from new it's got 188 mile an hour top speed 454 horsepower and not 16 four and a half seconds so it's by no means slow no but it does have switch gear from a Fiat Punto in it it really I know I would say that out of all the cars we've looked at today and let's be brutal here Aston Martin's old sort of interior range isn't good no this but, is worse than that yeah yeah, yeah. The, Aston, yeah the old Aston Martin one is bad this takes the mick. Some of the switch gear in here is absolute, and I might add, bet, this is a 2017 car. And I might add, it's costing you about seventy one thousand pounds. Don't get me wrong; it's significantly less than the eight C, but the interior is just something to behold. Yeah, isn't the it? reason the Alpha Eight C interior isn't that bad is because there is nothing in it. Yeah. Whereas this, they've got switch gear straight out of a Fiat Punto. They've got the the climate control screen. I don't know if you, if anyone listening to this back, will the, some of you'll definitely remember it. It's got the green background with the black letters on it. I can't even remember the name of it. It's like that. It's like a digital. It's like a digital calculator, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, basically, that's the screen for your climate control. This is a 2017 car. Yeah. That is really, really poor. It does have a big screen, don't get me wrong. But an enormous bezel that goes yeah, around it. massive bezel that goes around it. It looks very, very cheap. And the buttons underneath it, I have definitely seen them in other cars. Same with the actual 8C, to be honest. Some of the switch gear in there I've seen in Fiat Puntos. It, it's dreadful, actually. Yeah. However, <laughs> it's, it's really bad. It but, is bad. It is but, really, really bad. But what I will say is, and this is the truth, that's not what this car is about. No, it's not at all. And, and it's the same for the 8C. Both of these do fill the same brief. They're somewhat different. You've decided not to go for like a 911. You've decided yeah. to go for something different. But you'll get more looks in this. You'll get more looks. I think they're prettier. Yeah. I think you'll get a lot more looks from car people saying, why? Yeah, no, as in, but, I think they're prettier. And much prettier. Yeah, I think they fill a similar brief. And the this is the MC Stradale version. Um, the sound from these cars is one of the best sounds oh, from any engine ever made. It's dirty. I think the only ones that probably are better than it is the LFA, the Carrera GT. Uh, poten- I don't know, potentially the Ferrari V8, but that comes down to preference. That's more of a screaming V8. This is more of a... Yeah, low this end is run, a base type yeah. affair. Basic V8. Um, so, realistically then, um, out of the 8C and the Gran Turismo, which one would you oh, be going for? God, it's a tough choice because the prices are so far apart for the same car. But if I was just going to... Money's base... no object. All right, 8C then. 8C, yeah, yeah, agreed. But if you want similar thrills... If you were into that, would you say that the Gran Turismo is a good alternative? Well, it's essentially the same car, so yeah. Yeah, I, is, I would agree. It, it so is. As and well. again, it's not an ugly car, and you will get a lot of looks in that if that's what you want from a Your car. Your praise be being unique. Yeah. So actually, this this is the car for posing and driving around central London. It's crap to drive anyway, realistically. So it doesn't, yeah. you're not really missing out if you're not hooning down the country road. But you want to be seen. But right? you want to be seen. It's a very good looking car. It sounds great. So you'll get the people looking, turning their heads when you're driving along. And yeah, that's probably a more realistic thing rather than buying something like a, I don't know, a Ferrari Speciale to drive around or GT3 RS. And out of all of the cars we've reviewed today, which DBS. is the one? Yeah, me too. DBS. Not even, not even, it's close. Not even close. It's, yeah, it's the it? DBS. Yeah. It's the DBS is the one I would be no, taking on with. This, not even just because of the James Bond thing. It's just because I no, it's just because yeah. it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's reasonably priced for what you get. Yeah, I say reasonably it's expensive, but it's reasonable for what you get, and I think it will hold its value if not go up. Yeah, I would agree. I think all round, it's probably the best car out of it, and I'm including the AC in this as far as an investments concerned because as much as i like the 8c and i'm a, yeah it's a great investment but i want to drive the dbs more and it'll still be worth a decent amount of money when yeah, i'm done you, with well, it yeah you can drive it more if you drive the 8c and put miles on it it will just the 
price will plummet and you're gonna, it's already so expensive anyway yeah you're going to lose a lot of money but anyway on that note we will wrap this episode up uh, I do hope you've enjoyed it uh, if you do have any topics for us or anything you want us to discuss let us know in the comments or message us on social media and we will do that for you uh, if not we will be back next week with another episode yeah I'll see you later yeah goodbye <laughs>